I'm anticipating that the entire internet is gonna pile on us. My motivation was very simple. People were dying. It's my country, I'm gonna help. I was really appalled at the perverse motivations that I saw. If you dare to question any vaccine, you will be attacked. Why would a nine-month-old baby need to take the COVID vaccine? The list of people who received money includes Anthony Fauci. Why did mm -hmm. they force us to mask our kids and ourselves? The bottom line, masks don't work. The teachers broke every ethical and moral responsibility they have because our schools are run by the enemies of America. One of four college-age kids thought of killing himself. I'll never forget what they have done to us during COVID. Dr. Scott Atlas, thank you so much for coming in here today. Before we get started, I, I'm anticipating that the entire internet is gonna pile on us by the time we're done with this uh, interview because too much truth is gonna be said here. So to prevent that, can you please share with us your credentials, your backgrounds, your accomplishments, all of these things that you have done that have really led you to be able to speak bravely and accurately uh, about what we're seeing right now in the medical world in America. Okay. Um... I'm an MD. I went to University of Chicago uh, for medical school. I, uh, for the past decade, have been full-time healthcare policy. In fact, I've worked on healthcare policy for about 20 years. That overlapped with a 25-year career as a clinical doctor, an academic uh, medical scientist, and a professor at some of the best medical centers in the country. I've published over 100 peer-reviewed papers. Uh, I had received over 30 NIH and other grants. I've been a visiting professor at probably every top medical school in the country. Uh, I've given hundreds of invited lectures pre-COVID. Uh, and I was a professor and chief of a division of a department at Stanford University Medical School before I took the full-time position in healthcare policy at Hoover Institution, which is a public policy institute at Stanford University. So some of this background led you to become an advisor on the COVID response committee for the White House. Right. I was called up uh, in July of 2020 by the personnel office in the White House, and they asked if I would be interested in at least speaking to the president. So, of course, I'm an American. Uh, it's my field, healthcare policy. The policies that were being done were completely wrong. It was obvious from the earliest days to anyone who knew anything about infectious disease and, and clinical or uh, really medical science at all that these were very harmful. It was contrary to known pandemic management. So in July of 2020, I of course said yes. Uh, and I went to Washington and talked to everybody who people have heard of, you know, the vice president, the president, Mark Meadows, Jared Kushner, many other people uh, about what was happening in the pandemic. I bet you remember those moments pretty vividly given how significant it was. What was it like working there and who were you interacting with? Were you interacting with Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks? Were, did you have meetings? Did you converse about the data that you were finding and the policies that were set for the country? Well, uh, the first, the day uh, that I got there, which was in mid-July, I went through and I was asked a bunch of questions by all these various people. At the end of the day, Jared Kushner turned to me and said, well, we, we'd like you to advise the president. Would you be willing to do that? And I said, well, of course I would. People are dying, uh, but this is what you're going to get. And I said, you're going to get somebody who is not, I'm not going to agree with something that's wrong, I don't care who tells me to, even the president. I'm not going to agree with a group statement if I don't believe in it. I'm not going to sign on to what someone else said because they said it. And uh, Jared turned to me and said, well, that's exactly why we want you. And so I was, I was happy to hear that. Uh, but then the next sentence he said was, but I'm very concerned if it becomes, once it becomes public, they're going to destroy you. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a political person. I was very naive about the way Washington worked. And uh, I said, well, that doesn't sound so good to me. 
Uh, I was sort of shocked he even cared that they were going to destroy me, so I was relieved, but I was uh, very worried. And so I said, let me try this from California. And so I flew back home to Stanford, and over the next few days, it just was obvious it wasn't going to work. It was ad hoc. Things were being made. Decisions were being made. Statements were being made that were completely wrong. And the president of the United States was being fed completely wrong information from Fauci and Burks who were at that point having run, they were running the White House Coronavirus Task Force for six months before I walked in. So I decided to go back at the end of July and July 31st, I showed up as an advisor to the president. I'm getting around to answering your question. And so- That's fascinating, actually. uh, I got there and uh, I thought I would be the advisor to the president behind the scenes, non-public. I I wasn't interested in being a public figure at all. And I was told, well, no, we want you to sit in on the task force too and be part of that. And I said, well, but but that doesn't make sense to me. They're they're not going to, we know what they're doing. They're doing lockdowns, school closures. They're destroying people. They're not going to take an advice of someone from the outside. And they said, well, no, we want you to try to convince them, you know, the data. So I said, okay, so I was part of the task force also. And then, uh, therefore, the task force, I could talk about how that how that worked. There were task force meetings. My first one, really, that I sat in on was mid-August, second week of August, 2020. And it was a table of about eight people. Vice President Pence was the actual head of the task force. Uh, but at the table were uh, Dr. Fauci, who was not head of anything, but he was there as the head of the infectious disease part of the NIH. Deborah Burks, who was the head of the White House coronavirus medical side of the task force. She was the official head. She was the White House coronavirus task force coordinator. Redfield, Robert Redfield was the head of the CDC. He was at the table. And then there were various other people at the table and in the room around the around the table, the periphery were another dozen or so people. Then there was a spillover room uh, of filled with people. Then there were people on video and telephone. So there were a lot of people, but there was this set of about eight people at the table and those meetings were irregularly held, but I was at those meetings. And at those meetings, uh, in the first meeting, I remember uh, there was some statements made that were completely wrong uh, about the risk to children. And uh, Vice President Pence said, well, we we all agree with this, right? Because I hadn't said anything at that point, and I was the newcomer, the outsider. And uh, he sort of saw the look on my face that I probably, probably didn't agree. And he said, well, Scott, you're here because we want to hear what you have to say. And I said, okay, I totally disagree. And that became sort of a catchphrase that my friends in the White House would say, because I said it so often, I totally disagree because these people were completely wrong. And the the, the sad part was they had no data. Uh, there were these sophomoric charts tabulated by Deborah Burks that a middle school uh, student could, could put together with color coding, arbitrary categories of red, yellow, green, danger, risky, not a risk, but they were just arbitrary. The cutoffs for cases, for whatever the criteria was, there was no real science or scientific debate, except when I was asked a question, I was prepared with a dozen, two dozen scientific papers, all the data I'd gone through with uh, the, the skepticism about the study designs that you're supposed to have as a medical scientist. And so when I was asked a question, I would go through the data. And there was never a single meeting, and this is sort of shocking to even keep reliving, uh, not a single time where Deborah Burks or Anthony Fauci or Robert Redfield brought scientific papers into the meeting. Not a single time was anything I said ever refuted by criticism of the data or our, our alternative numbers or other data. Not a single time was there a criticism about a study being designed, except for me when I would say, of course, as a medical scientist for decades, the way you look at a study is you look at the study design first. If the study design is flawed, the val- the conclusions are not valid. Not a single time did I ever hear Redfield, Burks, or Fauci ever criticize a study design. 
And even worse, not a single time did they disagree with each other, which of course is unheard of, implying that they were just, there was a group think going on, not critical thinking. But the bottom line of not a single time is not a single time did they disagree with me on data. The only comment was, Scott, you're an outlier, which of course is not the thinking, not, not a scientific argument. It's not a debate. It's not a, a way to, to have a discussion. You discuss the data. Uh, instead, it was ad hominem, you're fringe, you're an outlier. Uh, and it's also the thinking of a bureaucrat uh, because it's not the way any scientific conference I've ever attended was. It's not the way we do discussions of scientific data. It, it's just not, uh, it's not appropriate. So it's, it's very, it should be very frightening to everybody who's watching this to even know this, that the people running and advising on the medical science, advising the medical policy were not medical scientists. They were bureaucrats. Fauci was in his position for 38 years. Deborah Birx was a government employee for 40 years. These were bureaucrats. They didn't act like scientists. They didn't think like scientists. They didn't know the data. And when they were uh, wrong, because they were typically wrong, everything they were saying, and I was showing the data to show they were wrong, they were frustrated rather than coming back and having the, the engaged discussion. Can you give examples of things that you brought to the table, things that are so obvious? I'm, I'm assuming there are things that we know today that are like clearly obvious that you brought to the table then and that they rejected. And also, why would they reject these things? Like, why were they so married to a, you know, a certain perspective and were not open to hearing from somebody like you or even bringing in more people like you to the table so that there is like real scientific debate? Yeah. I'm going to answer the last part first, because I think this is this is a, a perfect illustration of why they didn't want to bring in more people. Uh, I, I have two uh, stories to relate that. One was uh, Fauci called me up and he said, Scott, we'd like to have a meeting of the doctors on the task force and see what we have as common ground. And I said, OK, uh, that's great. I'd like to bring in some of the epidemiologists uh, who are doing the research. I want to bring in medical scientists who are doing the research on the pandemic. Because, of course, Fauci, Redfield, Burks, they're not doing research. Mm. Uh, and I said, that's great. I'm going to have uh, some of the world's top epidemiologists and the infectious disease experts and virologists come in who are doing the research on this pandemic and we'll have a discussion of the data. That was the end of the discussion. That, said, because no. they didn't want to do that. Fauci drop that, that was never brought up again, because what they instead wanted was Fauci, Burks, Redfield, and me only, with no witnesses as to what was going on. I wanted to bring in the people doing the research, and let's have a real discussion. So that was that's one example. Uh, the second example, though, is more, more flagrant, and this is uh, my role as an advisor to the president was to answer his questions and give him the best information that was available. And I thought, okay, this is very important to get the people doing the research in to answer the president of the United States questions, not to get him to be persuaded by me, to have him ask his questions to the people doing the research. So I arranged five people to come in and including myself and answer questions, have a discussion with the president in the Oval Office. And we arranged that uh, to occur in August of 2020, which is one of the first things I did, uh, with the idea that Burks would be able to come because we kept, we arranged it and she couldn't come because of her schedule. So we changed the date so she could come. And this was all set up. And I had uh, Dr. Martin Koldorf, who was a professor at Harvard Medical School. I had Jay Bhattacharya, a professor at Stanford Medical School. I had uh, Cody Meisner, a professor at Tufts in pediatric infectious disease in Boston. I had Joe Ladapo, a professor in health policy at UCLA. And I had myself, and we all were organized, and we were coming in. And this was all set to have Burks attend also. And then I was called into Jared Kushner's office less than 24 hours before the meeting. And I was told the meeting's not, not on. It's, it's canceled. First of all, some of these people are already flying. To Washington. And I said, well, what do you mean it's canceled? And they said, well, Burke sent an email 
saying uh, she's uncomfortable, she's not going to come. And so I said, well, no, that's unacceptable. I said, first of all, the meeting was set to have her come. Second of all, if she, if she doesn't know enough or is so insecure about her knowledge that she can't come, okay, well, that's too bad. That's an indication about her. That doesn't mean we cancel the meeting because of the optics of how it would look to have a meeting without Deborah Burks there. We're there to answer the president's questions. And uh, in fact, this is one of the, this is the only time where I, th I really thought I was going to quit because if they were to cancel that, I, I thought it was so outrageous. People are dying. We need to stop people from dying. The president of the United States has questions. It's insane to not have the world's best scientists who are doing the research on the pandemic come in and, and help uh, because of some optics to the public if Burks can't come. And so, uh, to Jared's credit, he said, okay, we'll have the meeting. You're right. But it'll only be five minutes. <laughs> and it'll be a hello. Meet and greet was the term that it was told to me. And at first I was like, oh my God. But I said, okay, I mean, that's, let's see how it goes. It's better than nothing. So we all went. And right before the meeting in the Oval Office, where they originally were going to have open press Q&A, press release, because, uh, you know, not just answering the president's questions is good, but obviously the country was in a state of panic. The news media was saying Trump doesn't listen to the science. You would think people would want to have their fears allayed and the press would want it publicized that actually great scientists were talking to the president. Uh, but no, the, the people in the uh, PR side or whatever, uh, political consulting, thought this was a bad idea to have other scientists come in and answer the president's questions. This is in August of 2020. So anyway, we come in and uh, I was told five minutes, people were tapping on, we're sitting at the Oval Office uh, right in front of the desk of the president. And I was told, okay, Scott, you got five minutes. So the president said, okay, Scott, uh, tell us what we're going to do here. So I introduced everybody and I said, we're here to answer your questions. And I had, had previously said to the doctors who I had come in, we have no time here. Don't go off pontificating about your favorite topic here. Just answer his questions and be truthful, whatever he asks. And so he started to ask questions and he went through and asked all the appropriate questions about lockdowns, about school closures, about the risk to children, about hydroxychloroquine, about Sweden, about what's happening uh, with economic uh, shutdown, et cetera, on public health. And he went through and asked point by point all of the five of us these questions, and it went on for 45 minutes. And I kept being tapped on the shoulder saying, Scott, you know, wrap it up. We have other things. And I said, okay. But meantime, I'm not going to, I'm not going to interrupt the president of the United States. That's obvious. Secondly, this was important. Third, he was asking great questions and in fact called in his video maker and said he was so happy to have what he called five geniuses here, uh, that he, uh, he brought in the video. And uh, I narrated a small video and we introduced ourselves on the video. Of course, that video has been suppressed. There was never a press release. Uh, it was viewed as, as harmful that it was held without Burks. But Burks backed out of it and, in fact, tried to sabotage it, I, I, I believe. Uh, but luckily, we, we were there. And so this is an example, to get back to your question, uh, people that are advising the president, why are they afraid to have expert scientists come in. They're just protecting themselves. This is the mentality of an insecure bureaucrat doing the CYA for their own position. And in fact, this was validated, this opinion of mine was validated later because uh, Burks in early 2021 admitted, although I didn't know it at the time during 2020 when I was there for the three and a half months I was there, Burks admitted that they had a pact, Burks, Fauci, and Redfield, that if any of them were fired by Trump, they would all quit immediately. Now, first of all, that's, uh, to me, that strikes me as people not caring if people are dying. They care about their own position, okay? Uh, 
But second of all, this is the mark of people who are extremely insecure. They had different motivations. My motivation was very simple. People were dying. It's my country. I'm going to help. And uh, I was really appalled at the perverse motivations that I saw. Okay, admittedly, I'm naive. I'm not a political person. Uh, but I was shocked. And I think people should be shocked and appalled at what happened. I'm very curious about the motivation of this you know, political medical group that seems to be running D.C. policy and, and you know, shutting the doors of, of, of those who actually understand what's happening out there on the ground. And I want to get into it. But before we get into the motive, I just want to know the truth, doctor. I really, really do. I mean, I, I have three kids. I know that many people who are listening we want to know the truth, given that the, the the truth has been censored. What were things that you knew back then and you still know today that we should know? I have a list of these things about Corona, sure. COVID. First of all, Corona, SARS, COVID. To us, it was um, projected as if it's a completely brand new beast and nobody knew how to he handle it. And it was just this like overwhelming environment where, you know, the t scientists can't really do science because it's completely new. Is it really, was it really that new for you guys? Were you so lost that you didn't even know where to start when it came to COVID? How new was it? Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is no. Uh, it, it was not so lost and new and new information. No information was known. This is one of the many lies and I, I don't want to use the word misinformation because it's such an overused <laughs> word, but uh, there were several false beliefs put forward to the public. And when I say false, I'm talking about things that we knew in spring of 2020, not learned, not learned in 2021, 2022, 2023. We knew. What did we know? Okay, what were the false statements? Number one, everybody's at risk to die. That's just false. From the earliest data of the cruise ship, uh, the Japanese cruise ship, we knew uh, that this was a virus that, thank God, was uh, essentially spared younger people. And the high-risk population were elderly people uh, with, with a lot of comorbidities. But you know, one of the falsehoods, everyone's at risk to die. The fatality rate was extraordinarily high, 3.4% by the World Health Organization. That was false. We knew it at the time. Anybody with five minutes of time who was a medical scientist would have known that that's a fraction. And the it's the number of people who died divided by the number of people who were infected. And the bottom number in the WHO calculation was only considering the people who were so sick that they went to see a doctor. But as we know from other viral respiratory infections, including coronaviruses, which this is one of the members of the family of coronaviruses, four or five of which are already circulating in our, in our, in our civilization, uh, the bottom number should have been everybody who's infected because many, maybe half, are totally asymptomatic maybe even more have such minimal symptoms. So the infection fatality rate was grossly overstated. That was known. Uh, there was no protection from this virus that it was totally new. No, it wasn't. It was not completely new in that it's a member of a virus family, coronaviruses, uh, that other parts, that parts of the world had a lot of uh, protection from. And this is probably one of the reasons why some of the countries in Asia had lower infection fatality rates from this virus because they had more experience with SARS-1, for instance. Mm -hmm. And there already was data in the summer of 2020 that showed that there's uh, immunological reaction of old blood samples from SARS-1. We're talking about many, many years beforehand. So therefore, we're never exposed to SARS-2. When you put the SARS-2 virus in, it elicited an immunological response. Okay, that implies an overlapping biological protection because it's a member of the same family, okay? The other lies, uh, everyone uh, it has the same risk. I already said that's false. Everyone spreads uh, equally. That's just not true. That was not true from the data in Europe uh, that everyone... Um, Can I ask you about that? Sure. So one of the things that we were told was that asymptomatic people would spread the virus. And that's why children 
who were not symptomatic were very dangerous because they would possibly carry it and kill the el- elderly without mm-hmm. knowing it. Did you guys know? Th- First of all, is that even true? Yeah, there's two parts to the, to the answer. Part one is that it was known from schools open in studies were done in Sweden and Finland and elsewhere. Uh, early on, in spring, summer 2020, it was known that open schools do not have a higher rate of infection than closed schools. They do not increase the infection rate of the teachers. They do not increase the infection rate of the community. There was zero harm. It was known that schools should be open. That that whole thing was, was a lie. The second sub-bullet point sort of under that is that in the United States, teachers did not have a higher risk. And in fact, teachers are a low-risk population. The median age of a K-12 through teacher in the United States is 41. Okay, so half the people are under 40. This is a low-risk group. 92% of teachers are under 60 in the United States. Remember, the high-risk group is people who are very old. And and are there any high-risk teachers? Of course there are. There are immunocompromised teachers. There are immunocompromised students. Okay, we could protect them. They don't have to even go in. Uh, so, but teachers were not high risk. Uh, but the second part is, do, do, and there was also several studies. There were about a dozen studies in the early 2020 literature from Sweden, uh, the Netherlands, France, South Korea, the UK, uh, Spain, Italy, Finland, Denmark, that children were not significant spreaders. Okay, so that was proven children were not significant spreaders of the, of this virus. Uh, and children were not, of course, at high risk. In fact, healthy children had a minuscule risk. This was known early on. And in fact, even on retrospective analysis of the nation of Germany's data, during 2020, pre-vaccine and the most lethal form of the virus, Zero healthy children died in Germany. Zero. Not zero percent. Zero. The numbers of children that died in the United States are extremely low. Were there children that died? Yes, there were children that died. Almost all of them, and perhaps all of them, it's not clear, had underlying comorbidities. Healthy children had minuscule risk. This was known. This was known early on. In fact, people under 20. The survival rate is 99.997% of people under 20. The data now, by the way, shows in retrospect, not now, but the data from from the most lethal form of the virus, two-thirds of deaths were in people that were over the age of life expectancy. It's not minimizing that people died. Uh, But two-thirds of deaths were were in people that had six or more comorbidities. So if you're old and you have hypertension or high blood pressure that's treated, you're you're not necessarily at high risk. It's old people who had six comorbidities or more. Okay, you have to be elderly and frail. So there was a gross overstatement as to who had risk. There was a distortion and there was not significant risk really from children specifically. There was nothing special about them. And then the last part of your question is asymptomatic spread. And Fauci said, uh, he was all over the map on many different things, but early on he said something correct, which is that asymptomatic people are not the drivers of viral respiratory epidemics. And that's true in this one. Okay, most, most of the infection was not driven by asymptomatic people. Could asymptomatic people spread? Yes. No one's saying that that never happened. That isn't the point. Uh, Similarly, uh, interestingly, almost all cases or the vast majority of cases were spread indoors. So, of course, the lockdowns recommending people stay indoors and pulling people off the beaches, forbidding them from being in the parks, taking boats out to arrest people surfing out off the coast of San Diego. I mean, this was a completely antithetical opposite to what was known. So, so many things were known. By the way, I do, I do want to get to one other thing that was a lie uh, that was perpetrated on the public, which was that there's no protection other than a vaccine. Okay, this, this doesn't just erase decades of immunology literature 
that we get a recovery from a virus infection, you have biological protection that is long lasting against a serious illness or death. That was known not just for decades, not just for hundreds of years, but as my friend Martin Kaldorf said, for, for thousands of years. Uh, I mean, this, was, this, this recovery from a virus generating long lasting biological protection was known, yet it was overtly, explicitly denied by people in the task force, by the media, and by many medical scientists. Well, some of the things that we used to bring up is what about herd immunity? And they seem to reject that and basically say, even if you also, even if you had COVID and you recovered, you still had to get the vaccine because the vaccine was better than your natural recovery from COVID. Yeah. I mean, the data on, on this is, okay, there, there's so many things in, the, in that question. <laughs> uh, first of all, you know, herd immunity is a biological phenomenon. It's not a strategy. It's not a, a goal of, of somebody who gets infected or something like this. It's, it was totally distorted. Uh, it's biology. Uh, it, is, it is a fact that when enough people get an infection and then therefore they have biological protection, they break the pathways to infecting other people. That is the theory on why you want a certain number of people to get vaccinated mm. to generate herd immunity. If you don't believe in that, you don't believe in vaccinating people. Uh, I mean, as Martin Kaldorf uh, memorably said, if you, saying there's a herd immunity strategy is like saying there's a gravity strategy for landing an airplane. Gravity exists, herd immunity exists. Now, uh, the, the immune uh, issue uh, is really not protection necessarily against getting any reinfection. But it's protection against getting the consequences that are serious, hospitalization requiring infection or death. That's what counts. It doesn't count. It, it, doesn't, it shouldn't matter to people that you don't get an infection as long as the infection has no significant consequence. Hmm. It's the consequences, and that is the long-term biological protection you have. Now, in terms of the data, the data in 2021 showed, even in the face of the most lethal form of the virus, the data out of other countries, which is what I actually trust more than the data coming out of the United States, sad mm -hmm. to say. But when you looked at the data from Israel in 2021 on the vaccine, the data showed that there was better protection in people who recovered from the infection and never had the vaccine than in people who never had the infection and took the vaccine better protection, better protection against reinfection, better protection against serious illness, better protection against death. The biological protection from recovery should never have even been controversial. In fact, it's not knowledge you need to take a PhD course in. It's not epidemiologist level knowledge. It's not infectious disease level. It's not doctor level. It's if you have a high school kid who's in AP biology, is a senior in high school, he or she knows that if you recover from a viral infection, you have long lasting immunological protection. And it is not necessarily, by the way, measured in as antibody level in your bloodstream because it's in B cells and T cells, which are stored in other organs, including your bone marrow. And these are reactivated on infection. This is sort of acid, the detail, but, it, but I think people should know that this is not very complicated. This, this really, none of this was very complicated. It was exaggerated, it was distorted, it was lied about, about for many different reasons that I can go into, but it wasn't very esoteric level or even controversial. It should have never been. Well, I mean, you say that, you know, these details, maybe people would be bored by them. I actually think they're very important because things that we've heard for years, for years, things that made sense to us suddenly didn't make sense. And then there were these things that people were trying to use prophylactically. You know, you start with zinc and vitamin D. And if you dared to say something like hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin, you're piled on. And, you know, do you have any thoughts on, on, on any one of those? And Sure. I mean, what went on over there? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the most sordid uh, examples of harms inflicted on the public. Censorship, demonization and denial of fact. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, uh, 
this is the the whole censorship topic is a, is a big topic, and we could talk about why that was very effective because it was very effective. Uh, but but I, I think it's sort of interesting to go back and rewind the clock. Uh, and and it's just my opinion. But as soon as President Trump said prematurely uh, that hydroxychloroquine works, everybody should take it. There was an immediate reaction. No, uh, he said this. Therefore, no. This is my opinion uh, that it was political in the beginning. Uh, what happened was really a gross failure by Anthony Fauci, Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, the people in the head of the NIH and the head of the uh, other uh, public health agencies, in never looking at and conducting clinical trials early on in the in February March of 2020, drugs that were safe and already FDA approved. Hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin are safe drugs. That's a fact. They've been taken by billions, billions with a B of people all over the world for years for other diseases. Uh, so it was not true that they were dangerous. In fact, in many countries, by the way, hydroxychloroquine is an over-the-counter drug. You don't even need a prescription, but uh, it's very safe. Secondly, these are drugs that had mechanisms of action. This is a medical term that we look at a drug and we look at the way it works and we say, well, what does it do? Well, it blocks viruses from entering a cell. It, it inhibits the replication of a virus once it's in a cell or a variety of other things that indicated these mechanisms of actions of the way these drugs worked, safe and already FDA approved those mechanisms of action indicated they might work. They should have been investigated right away. They were not investigated. In fact, those drugs were deemed dangerous. Yes. The FDA and other organizations were tweeting out, as we saw on social media, uh, things that were completely inappropriate. Pharmacists were, were forbidding the filling of prescriptions. This is, I think, the first time in history, I don't know, uh, because the way medicine works uh, as a doctor, uh, you know, uh, I know this, that uh, doctors get a drug that is FDA approved and they have a license really to use it in any way they think is appropriate. And these drugs, are, again, were very safe, but they were blocked from filling these prescriptions. So, uh, but the real failure of the NIH was to not do the studies. And you have to wonder why were the studies not done on these drugs? I think this is a very intriguing question to ponder. Well, why they were not done? Why the why, clinical trials were why not were done? Why were so many doctors threatened with their medical license being taken from them for prescribing them to people? Why? Yes. Yeah, I mean, some of this was complete insanity, uh, but uh, I, I actually think there are some reasons why the drugs were not investigated possibly, at least we should consider this because uh, people may have died from not doing these trials. There's a couple of interesting things. Number one, if a trial showed that the drugs worked, then you could not use an emergency use authorization for the vaccine because those are not allowed once there is a successful treatment in place, an EUA, an emergency use authorization of an experimental drug. So that would have stopped that. Uh, secondly, there's the potential that there is pharma company corruption. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is it's been exposed by uh, data that was brought out by Open the Books, I think, that $325 million over the decade before COVID was given to employees of the agencies that approve and evaluate those drugs. Government agencies. Government agencies, NIH employees, CDC, FDA, they received $325 million in shared royalties from the private drug companies. Oh, Pre-COVID. <laughs> this is a, such an overt conflict of interest that it's, it's so shocking that that should never occur in a first world country at all, zero. It should be illegal. And by the way, the list of people who received money includes Anthony Fauci and others at the NIH. This is the decade before COVID. And so you have to wonder, uh, A, how that's even legal. That's an overt conflict of interest. B, why is it that we can't find out how much money 
Fauci and any other individual received. That's redacted. And so we need to have transparency on this sort of information. So I'm bringing that up here because that's a reason why perhaps, meaning the I'm, I'm saying as a hypothetical, why some of these f- drugs already FDA approved were never evaluated because it therefore paved the way for new drugs to be evaluated that were expensive prescription drugs. It, it brings up the question, was there pharma corruption, financial corruption, influenced by private drug companies, both on the vaccine side and on any other drug that was developed side. Uh, This was a gross failure of the NIH. I'd imagine anybody listening would say, well, but everywhere around the world, people were very concerned about COVID and they were waiting for the vaccine. How could American pharmaceuticals have that kind of impact? Well, I mean, first of all, we have the the most rapid development of vaccines and and other drugs uh, in the private sector. And that's a good thing. The world depends on innovation from the U.S. Uh, Secondly, the world uh, was extremely, although I can't quantify this, but uh, was obviously very influenced by the words of people like Anthony Fauci, the public health leaders in other countries, the public health leaders in in all the states. uh, it, uh, you know, it's interesting. Fauci says, well, quote, I never shut down schools, unquote. No, he literally didn't lock the door, but his advice was taken. Uh, so these people were very influential worldwide. Uh, and secondly, you know, when we shut down in the United States, we interrupt all the supply chains of all of all things, including causing unemployment in other countries. So the, the impact of what the U.S. did is massive, uh, although your, your question does bring up a legitimate question is, therefore, it wasn't all political because the other countries did these lockdowns too. And, and I agree with that. It wasn't. It started out perhaps at least in part as political, uh, but it would rapidly became an obsession. Lockdown, shut schools, deny all biology, disregard the actual data on this virus, uh, and do things that were not only completely contrary to common sense and to the data, but the lockdowns themselves were a break with what standard pandemic management was. Standard pandemic management dated back to 2006 review paper from Henderson and colleagues, the person credited with eradicating smallpox, who wrote on viral respiratory infections that lockdowns do not work and lockdowns are extraordinarily harmful. That was known. The standard was not lockdowns. They, the lockdowners, implemented a reckless pseudoscientific policy. I'm curious if you think the World Health Organization had anything to do with it, given that you know, we're, we're wondering why these other countries locked down? Well, absolutely. The World Health Organization occupies a very prestigious and important and highly influential role. It's it's the most important, most prominent international public health agency. And and in, in good hands, it serves an important role. It gives data, it gives information, it gives reasonable recommendations. But in this case, the World Health Organization was an abject failure a fraud and run by someone who is grossly incompetent and should not be in charge of the World Health Organization, and that's Tedros, the director. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, Tedros, uh, as the director, was putting forth lies. What do I mean by lies? Well, he, he praised China for transparency in January 2020, in February 2020, all throughout 2020, and even in 2021, He praised China as a model of transparency when China blocked the WHO itself from inspecting the Wuhan labs. So this is, this is completely irrational or points to complete corruption. I don't know what the answer is, but that, that's certainly a lie. Uh, he said that China was a model for pandemic management when China did the, some of the most barbaric lockdowns, indeed human rights violations, imprisoning their own citizens, forbidding them from even getting their own medications for other illnesses, uh, and lying to the world, covering up the origin of the virus, etc. Tedros 
also uh, rewrote guidelines on masks that were erratic. He, he, he censured his own scientists from saying that asymptomatic spread was not the big driver, even though it was. Uh, they changed biological definitions on their website of herd immunity to saying herd immunity only comes from vaccines. And then they changed it back to the real definition, which is from infection protection or vaccines. Uh, and in fact, when you look at the WHO's performance, for more than a decade, they've been an abject failure. H1N1, Zika, uh, mm -hmm. COVID, uh, all the other pandemics that they've dealt with. And in fact, Tedros himself, when he was director of, of public health in Ethiopia, before becoming head of WHO, he was caught lying. He covered up a cholera outbreak in Ethiopia. So this is a guy who has no integrity. So the, the bottom line is, yes, WHO put forth misinformation, in, incorrect information, lies, etc. And yes, WHO has lost its place as a credible health agency. And in fact, the U.S. has leverage. We're the number one funder of the WHO. We're not on the board of the WHO, by the way. The board includes North Korea. We're funding it. We're the we're main not funder. On the board. We're not on the this so-called board of the WHO, while a country like North Korea is on the board of the WHO. Uh, the guys, Tedros seems to be a mouthpiece for China. There's certainly no transparency. Uh, it's gross incompetence at 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 best. Yeah. Uh, there's also malfeasance going on and, and really an abuse of public trust. So we need to use our leverage. We can't take taxpayer money and fund WHO to the tune of $400 million a year of our money. It's, it, you know, the government, it's not the government's money, it's taxpayer money. It's unbelievable. We need to put a hold on all the funding of the WHO and not just not support them, but investigate them for the malfeasance and hold some accountability here to what was done. Them along with the UN. Can you give me some clarity about masks? Uh, this is something very personal to me, given that I have three kids under the age of 11 and they grew up um, in an environment where when we had to fly, we would have to mask our sure. two and three-year-olds. Yes, masks, no masks. Is it absolute BS? Why did mm -hmm. they force us to mask our kids and ourselves? Okay, I'm a very direct person. And uh, the, the bottom line, masks don't work. What do I mean masks don't work? Masks do not protect the person wearing them, nor do they prevent the spread of a viral respiratory infection. And I'm not talking about a scarf on your face. I'm talking about surgical masks. Do not work. It's proven they do not work. It was known they do not work in spring of 2020. The data published on the website of the CDC published a review of all randomized clinical trials on masks for influenza virus in May 2020. Now, why was that relevant, by the way? Re influenza virus is about the same size, roughly, as the SARS-2 virus. And that size is smaller than the pore size in a surgical mask. So, of course, anybody with a brain would say, oh, wow, the virus is so small, it goes through the surgical mask. Uh, probably doesn't work. But if you look at the actual data published by the CDC in all the reviews, uh, in May of 2020, surgical masks do not prevent the spread and do not uh, protect the wearer. And that is true. That was proven time and time again, not just by looking at the data in all the states, in the cities, in the world, also by looking at the studies that were published and eventually did get published, uh, Annals of Internal Medicine, the so-called Denmark study, uh, where they showed that there was no significant decrease in infections of SARS, proven, by the way, by blood tests, not just of SARS-2 virus, but of, I think, 11 other viruses in the study, uh, because, of course, it doesn't work. Uh, and then on and on, there were studies shown about masks until finally the Cochrane Review, which was done, published in 2023, which isn't a new study. It's a review of all the studies, literally all of the studies on masks. And their conclusions were twofold. Masks do not work, surgical masks, number one. And if I may quote the senior author of the study, Tom Jefferson of University of Oxford, quote, masks do not work, period. That was his statement. And the second part of their conclusion was not only surgical masks don't work, but 
N95 masks do not work. That's the review of the data, of all the good data. That's not, and that's not an opinion, that's fact. There, it's like saying, I mean, here's what we know. One plus one equal two, the earth is round, masks do not work. Did Dr. Fauci, Dr. Birx know this? Yeah, there's very little that they really knew, but I can tell you that early on, uh, were they made aware the con- of it? Did they see the data? Did oh, I, I said all the data. Uh, uh, but in addition, early on, I don't think uh, people realize this that Dr. Fauci wrote in his own email that was uncovered by uh, FOIA requests to his friends early on in 2020. Uh, masks are not going to be protective, and the, the reasons are because the virus is smaller than the mask, and the, they're not, they don't, they so don't he work. Knew. He knew. But then later he changed it. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, I, I actually, I'm not, I'm not sure. It's hard to guess at what motivation is people have to say things, of course. But I, I tell you what I saw. This was one of the most horrendous examples of the lack of, of scientific thinking on the task force. More than once, and I wrote about this in my book, I saw Fauci or Redfield say, and here we're talking August 2020, September 2020. They had been saying mass work for six months already, and it was proven. Under oath, they said it in congressional testimony. Uh, But somehow they would blurt out, I have proof that mass work at the task force meeting, which I found funny, really, because if they knew they work, what are they trying to prove it still? Obviously, they, they, didn't, they didn't have proof it worked. But secondly, they would hold up a single chart. And this happened more than once. And, they, and Redfield, for instance, I wrote about this, would say, look, in this city, the mandate for masks went, went on on this day and the cases came down. Were they and, wearing masks, by the way, while having these meetings with you? Or else Fauci, sitting there with Fauci masks? Fauci typically came, on, came in with a mask and about halfway through, it would be under his chin, and by the end, it would be hanging from his one ear or whatever. I like mean, uh, most people didn't didn't wear masks in the ta- in that room, uh, but they they really it's hard to say what they knew because they weren't they weren't thinking like scientists. And finally, I I actually got burned out from refuting the data with all the studies because I was talking to people who just didn't believe in fact, mm. and and that becomes you know it's. I, I couldn't go on. Uh, and so finally, I, I, at times I just sat there and said nothing. But other people at the table who were non-medical would say, uh, well, Dr. Redfield, why couldn't it be that uh, it's just the timing of it? In the, the other city, they put the mandate on or people were wearing masks and the, and the cases kept going up. And there was, of course, no answer for this. Or one time Fauci said he compared two cities and one be wearing masks, therefore masks work because mm. cases came down. And some other non-medical person at the task force would say, well, uh, you know that doesn't prove it because there, there's a lot of differences between those cities and what the people were behaving like. I mean, that doesn't prove it. The good studies are the ones I said, the Denmark study and the Cochrane review of all the studies and the review of the CDC in, in May of 2020. It's proven there, there is no argument whatsoever that masks protect the wearer or that prevent the spread of the infection. The other point I, I want to make, the irony of the whole thing was the U.S. guidance was doubling down on the most bizarre, safest environments. Schools were a safe environment. We knew that children did not have a significant risk. Children were not big spreaders. Teachers were not high risk, yet they were implementing much stricter guidelines in schools. Okay, this doesn't make sense. Uh, Similarly, in airplanes, the air in an airplane is refreshed and filtered every 30 to 90 seconds. You couldn't get a safer environment than being in an airplane. And yet, we had masks mandated in airplanes, and in between bites, you were supposed to put up your mask over your face. The whole thing was completely nonsensical and denying reality. And I, and I think that's very frightening because, you know, we have to live in an objective society. We're, we're thinking people. The difference between a person and a, and, a, and a dog is you have the ability to reason. And if you're not using the ability to reason, uh, I think we're in total disarray a, 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 as a civilization. Doctor, were the leaders of the teachers' unions aware of all this data that masks don't work, 
that the lockdowns don't work, that kids are not at high risk, that, you know, forcing them to vaccinate is unnecessary. They put so much pressure on parents and families. They kept the clue, the schools locked out. Right. Did, this did, is, they, did they actually, did they, were they given the data or can they lean well, on the excuse that they just didn't know and they were no, so confused? No, it's a lie. Okay, the, this is one of the greatest sins in my view. Uh, the big sin what we as a society did to children, uh, okay. I mean, and I and I, you know, I, I don't want to get choked up about I mean, talking I about could it. Just but burst it's just into tears right it, now. It's so awful. We broke the social contract we have as people by harming our children as a society and injecting, for instance, experimental drugs into children that have side effects many of which are uncertain for a disease that those children, healthy children, did not have a significant risk from, to use them as shields? I mean, this is almost unspeakable. You know, uh, anyway, uh, the, the, you're right. The, the ch- I mean, there's so much to say about the teachers, okay? These people are not acceptable to be given the serious job of educating our children, okay? And why do I say that? Number one, the teachers' unions, of course, are abhorrent. They they blocked uh, even the idea of them teaching remotely. I put four school guidelines in the White House. One of the first things I did in the first week of August I said, okay, what am I going to do here? I got there July 31st. I said, I'm going to go for low-hanging fruit. What's the low-hanging fruit? Well, children, healthy children have minuscule risk. Teachers are not, not, not at significant risk. That We need to educate our children. That's, there's nothing more important as a society than educating our children. So we need to open the schools. Uh, and so I said, okay. Let's put together an event. We put together an event in the White House, and it's on C-SPAN. People can look at this, the president, the vice president, and myself, Betsy DeVos, Secretary of Education at the time. And we invited and had in this event in the White House experts in education, but we had parents. We had parents of special needs kids. Uh, We had nurses. We had school officials. And we talked about the importance of opening schools. There is nothing more important. By the way, this is August of 2020. The CDC had already put forth the data. The evidence was there that, number one, it's extremely harmful on the learning loss side to lose in-person schools. And much worse for minorities and poor children. I mean, are we not a society that says we care about poor kids? so massive learning losses, the greatest losses in learning in the history of the assessments. But secondly, there was an explosion of psychiatric illness in teenagers and college kids from the isolation, not the virus. Explosion of self-harms, visits to doctors. What is that? That's teenagers putting out cigarettes on their skin, slashing their wrists because of the isolation, school closures. Massive explosion in drug abuse, substance abuse in teenagers, suicidal ideation in teenage girls, massive increase during the isolation of school closures. One in four college-age kids in the United States, the CDC reported in July of 2020, one of four college-age kids thought of killing himself. So... You know, uh, the teachers, they broke every ethical and moral responsibility they had to teach our kids. They were offered opportunities to stay home if they were afraid, if they were high risk. Teach from a distance, but you don't keep the kids out of school. But it and was they did. The union bosses. And the union used. bosses. Well, okay, there, there's two sides to it. One is that's true. It's the union bosses 
that advocated not just 2020, by the way, 2021, 2022. Which is two years after you all had all the data. They kept us out of school. Absolutely, absolutely. In California, by the way, our state, Governor Newsom's state, ranked dead last in percent of schools that were open. In fact, uh, in, in 2020, 2021, something like 15% of school children had in-person schools in California. In Florida, by the way, 100% of schools were opened in person for the 2020, 2021 year. A uh, similar state, by the way, just completely different response, different governor, uh, et cetera. So uh, the second part that I want to mention, it wasn't just the teachers' unions, in my view. And you know, I hate to insult teachers, uh, but the reality is the studies shown in this in 2020, they asked professions, are you how are you seriously afraid of getting COVID at work? Teachers were severe fear versus not big deal, five to one, something like this. Every other career was the opposite. Teachers were uniquely afraid. Are these people even thinking? Well, are, I mean, I don't not understand allowed this. To, teachers are not allowed to think. The union bosses think for but the teachers. But these are the people we've entrusted to teach our children. They yeah. have disqualified themselves by being irrational yeah. and by sacrificing children for their benefit. Right. And to me, the United States is a disgrace. And the reason I say it that way is... Our peer nations in Western Europe, they did severe lockdowns. Most of our peer nations in Western Europe, 2020 to 2021 school year, they opened the schools. You're right. We were the outlier. Right. Because our schools are run by the enemies of America. The union bosses, I'm a teacher myself. And in when I got my master's in education, it was made very clear to me that I'm not allowed to think. I do what the unions tell us to do. And that's part of the problem. There's real fear. I mean, I would say that the same thing is in your profession, the medical association. You know, I I believe that many doctors knew the truth. They knew that the masks don't work. They knew that hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin at the very least is not going to harm you. They knew these things, but they, they didn't speak out. They were controlled like little amoebas, or I don't know what it was, but like, how do yeah. we even regain trust in, in physician? It's a problem because we live in a society where we do need to trust physicians. We need to establish some sort of bond between the experts and, and the patients. But now we can't trust the experts because we feel like they're either controlled or not allowed to think. Mm-hmm. Like, how do we get out of this? Yeah, I mean, I think this is the the most profound uh, thing that we're dealing with now is uh, how to restore trust in in public health, also really in the experts that we rely on, and we need to rely on people uh, as a free society, as a very large and extremely diverse society with different opinions and different viewpoints. Uh, We need to have an ethical society. Ethical society requires uh, experts who are ethical. Uh, Now, uh, I do want to say before I go into how to restore trust, I want to mention something about the the medical community. The medical community was a disgrace during COVID. It's embarrassing to be a doctor and call these people my peers. And and I I know that sounds very harsh, but uh, doctors were sheep. Doctors were not looking at the studies. Doctors were um, not questioning things. I mean, I was raised perhaps in a different way. I'm not a member of the elite. Uh, my background is my, my, my parents didn't go to college. I was the first generation to go to college in my family. Uh, my grandparents were immigrants. So, you know, we had nothing. Uh, they had nothing when they came. Uh, but I was taught to have a healthy degree of skepticism, to question authority. Okay, I, I'm not afraid to question what I'm told. And I think we have a massive deficit in people who have enough courage to at least question what they're being told in this country. But the medical community failed, uh, and they failed because they acted like sheep. Uh, they didn't question what they were told. They didn't read the studies. 
I mean, they, they weren't fluent in the data, and it, it's very sad. Uh, it's embarrassing, uh, and they rightfully have lost trust. And, and I use the word rightfully in that it's not just the doctors, the teachers, as I mentioned, the public health leaders, people in government, people in the media. It goes on and on. All the institutions have lost trust, and there's nothing that has lost trust more precipitously, by the way, than the public health agencies. And this is from survey data. Uh, there's been, before COVID, something like two-thirds of people said the CDC and the FDA were doing an excellent or good job. And that's been, that's been cut uh, down to about 40%. Only 40% of people think the FDA and the CDC are doing a good job. And 60% of people think it's poor, <laughs> poor job. I mean, you have no, that's not a trust. And science itself has lost trust. Uh, in fact, it's politically split, which is a which is a real issue. You can't have people say that they don't trust science, uh, and 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 sadly, they need to question science because science is is the cause of the loss of trust. So, how do we restore trust? Is, well, is the me, I, if I can just add one more thing, I am not done being upset with the medical association because it's not just COVID. Even though I'll never forget what they have done to us during COVID, but. The other issues are, you know, boys are girls, girls are boys, this whole gender fluidity stuff. I mean, I interviewed this young woman who, when she was 13 years old, she just went through this entire, um, what will you call it, medical push to transition and become a boy. And they removed her breasts and they gave her all of these, you know, hormones. And then guess what happened? By the time she turned 18, she changed her mind. Mm -hmm. But that was too late. And I can't tell you how many stories of these kids are transitioning because the medical establishment is uh, to say that they're neglecting young kids is is an understatement. I mean, this is like Dr. Mengele. You know, this is actually ex experimenting on our young mm -hmm. children's sexuality. So it's not just COVID. You it, it's COVID, not just gender COVID. fluidity, like all of this stuff. Well, I, and I would say that there's there's a there's another reason besides doctors being uh, spineless sheep and not critical thinkers. The other reason is that uh, I think people don't understand the way science and medical research is funded. Mm. It's it's controlled by what I would call a cartel of people at the top. The NIH is the main funder of science in the United States and therefore the world uh, indirectly, <clears throat> the NIH is controlled by a cabal of very powerful, politically connected, interdependent people who are also the chairs of departments and medical schools, who also are the reviewers or editors in chief of the grant of the publications in science. And it turns out that every academic scientist, every university scientist, to get promoted needs an NIH grant. That's essentially true. And so I don't think the public understands that they're therefore dependent on the NIH. So you're not gonna get many assistant professors who are willing to sacrifice their career advancement by speaking out against the NIH, like Fauci or Collins. You're not gonna get many universities when there are more than 15 university medical centers in the United States, more than 15 that get over $500 million per year, every year, from the NIH alone. Half a billion dollars in funding the university medical centers per year from the NIH. Do you think that a lot of these university medical centers are gonna feel like they can speak out against the NIH when they don't wanna jeopardize their funding? I'm not making the excuse for them, I'm explaining their behavior. They are, they are dependent on the NIH and they are not, they don't have the integrity to speak out. And, and I think this is something very important that I do want to say is that uh, one of the things I learned about all this is there's so many people in our government, in positions of leadership, that they don't have the necessary integrity to be leaders. Okay, because integrity, at very least, is telling the truth. But secondly, there were people that apparently were willing to have people die as long as they stayed in power. And here I'm involving now the media. And, and I think the US has the most poisonous media in the world. Why do I say that? Uh, because when you look at, there's actual data on this in November, 2020, toward the end of 2020, a study was published, National Bureau of Economic Research. It compared the articles on COVID 
in the American media compared to the articles on COVID, the same pandemic, in the non-American English-speaking media. And they quantified if they were positive or negative about COVID. And it turned out that in the United States during 2020, 90 plus percent of articles about COVID were negative. Whereas only 52%, 54% outside the U.S. were negative about COVID. It's the same pandemic. It's like Why the is there fear a difference? Mongering fear type. mongering. In fact, even when cases were going down in the United States, the stories about cases going up in the United States media outnumbered the stories about cases going down right. by five to one. Even when cases were going down. Well, I can explain that to you because I run a media company. And so I have an example here that I've been actually meaning to share with you. So NewsGuard, which is the guardian of, of the news, it's ironic that they call them NewsGuard because they really guard like the Dr. Fauci's and the Dr. Burks and like, you know, their friends. They guard civilians from hearing the truth. That's what they do. They started setting us these threatening emails when we started sharing what you call positive messages about COVID and ways to, you know, either whether think about things prophylactically or just calm down or really just understand the truth. And when we would share stories of scientists and doctors, like the ones you were referring to earlier, these are the types of emails that we receive. I mean, they were just confront us and saying, this is not true. Can you, can you justify, you know, I, I'm going to post this as a link. So those who are listening can read some of these things, but you know, you made a false claim that children aren't actually dying from this virus. He, we cited a study which said that 150,000 people who had the virus, only 1.7% of them had been eight, from the ages of zero and 18. And that 1.7%, none of them died. You can read this whole thing. But basically what we were saying is that barely any kids are dying from, from COVID complications. The public should know. The public should be able to calm down. And when we would share information like this, they would threaten to go to the social media agencies and organizations and basically censor us and take us down. And there was a point where we received an email from one of our video servicing companies, JW Player, that said, we can't work with you guys anymore. You're spreading misinformation. And we would we would say, what do you mean misinformation? Here's all the data. Mm -hmm. No, it's not misinformation. It's information that the U.S. media and possibly, you know, some world organization, information that they don't want the public to hear. They didn't want us to give a platform to people like you. And right. they made it very clear that if we give a, a, a platform to people like you, we will be penalized. Yeah. I mean, I think this is one of the biggest topics that, that we need to be very aware of. And I think it's becoming more uh, public censorship. Okay. We're supposed to live in a free country. The solution to misinformation is more information. There is no one that should be trusted with the power to determine truth versus not. We're adults. We're thinking uh, human beings. We can discern. We're free society, by the way, I thought. Uh, now, thought? How, well, censorship is a problem for two reasons. I mean, I think people have to understand that it blocks people from speaking. But more importantly, it blocks people from hearing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is uh, the, the impact of censorship was profound during the pandemic. It was exposed by the pandemic, by the way. I'm not sure. I think we all sort of were in a false sense of belief before the pandemic. The pandemic exposed existing problems. I don't think it created these things. I think these things were probably already there. It just became obvious. Now, why did censorship work? Censorship uh, and this narrative worked, I really think, for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, they used the technique uh, that was that we've seen in 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 other horrific eras like Nazi Germany, and that is to demonize a group, and in this case, demonize people. They are dangerous if they're saying that these other data about COVID. Uh, secondly, they created this this 
lie that if you're saying you're against lockdowns, you're choosing the economy over lives. And in fact, that was an overt lie because there were decades of economic literature proving, and this is well known, that a severe economic downturn kills people, literally kills people, particularly poor people, by the way. Uh, but the third part is the cancellation culture, the, the, the overt censorship. It, first of all, it was effective in that it it not only stopped people from talking and from hearing, it also caused self-cancellation because I got hundreds of emails from scientists, including some from Stanford University, including from Stanford University infectious disease and epidemiology scientists saying, Scott, you're exactly right. Keep speaking the truth. We're afraid to step forward because we're afraid for our families and our jobs. So that, that was very effective, the cancel culture. And I think we know how much pressure is on people. Uh, but, but the other part is it causes the public to think that basically everybody agrees and these few people who get out there and say something opposite, that, that, that's really not true. There's a consensus of the experts and there wasn't a consensus of the experts. Uh, in fact, it was quite the opposite, mm. but they created a lie, the lie of the false consensus. That was this, this success of the censorship. Is it possible that some of the vaccines and the medications that are recommended to us need to be reviewed from the same skepticism that we need to look at what happened during well, COVID? Is absolutely. I mean, in fact, this is one of the other failures of this whole thing was the lack of transparency about the data. I, I don't understand why, I still don't understand why uh, somehow public health leaders and others morphed into this idea that their role is to persuade the public rather than show the data and persuade the public by the data. I wish uh, they just persuaded the public. They attack the public. Well, if you dare to question any vaccine, whether you're going to a pediatrician or just anybody, you will be attacked as a vax denier and everything, a kook at every single thing. And the truth is, I don't want to be a denier of anything. I just want to know the truth. Well, but why that, are we giving so many vaccines to children? Are well, they all good? The data showed that in 2020, there was evidence from other countries that it prevented people who are high risk to die from dying. That, that is the data. The virus evolved after that. The virus is not highly lethal. They mandated vaccines for people who didn't need the vaccines, who were not at significant risk. It's an experimental drug with unknown side effects. All those things were wrong. Mm. But uh, in my view, and in fact, I got up there at one of the press briefings asking about the vaccine rollout. And I said, yeah, but there won't be a vaccine mandate. There will never be a vaccine mandate, a requirement to take the vaccine. This was in October, 2020, I said that. Of course, Trump lost. The mandates were put in, in in January of 2020. So you were hoping that the vaccine I, would be available I don't to believe people. Trump would have, yeah, I don't believe. There was never any plan that I was aware of to have any mandatory vaccine mm -hmm. that I was aware of. And, and at that point in time, when Trump was still in office and you saw the original trials of the vaccine, it did, it did seem to work. We didn't but know you didn't it know worked the until risks. after, until November. Right. After the election. After the election. The trial was done, though, not to assess death because they didn't have people die. So they just did it in, in you know, uh, infection, symptomatic infection or not. It was based on symptomatic infection. One of the questions we're not allowed to ask is what are the possible dangers of the vaccine? And so, of course, I want to ask you that question, uh, especially when it comes to children that we know COVID is very unlikely going to kill them or you know, cause them severe health problems. Is it possible the vaccine could actually harm them? You hear about heart heart issues, menstrual cycle issues for for young women. Are you seeing any data on that side? Well, the data, uh, you know, this is one of the one of the other horrifying uh, parts of what happened during this whole debacle, which is that we've had five to 10 billion doses of the vaccines and we don't have a catalog of all the uh, good handle on all the side effects. Part of that is because it was suppressed. That in it clearly, the, the, the information was suppressed. There were compilations of side effects 
and studies done, but the studies were not able to be published until just recently. Uh, but the reality is uh, a significant potential side effect is inflammation of the heart. And that's called myocarditis. That's the heart muscle. Uh, and it turns out that some, somewhere on the order of one in 3,000 to one in 8,000 young males get myocarditis. Uh, and there's, there's data now coming out in peer-reviewed literature that there were a significant number of deaths from the vaccine. It doesn't mean that uh, everyone was going to die from the vaccine or that everyone's getting heart inflammation. But the reality is when you take a drug like the vaccine, for instance, there's always a question, cost-benefit. Uh, you know, personally, I don't, I don't want to take a drug unless I really think I'm going to benefit from the drug. Uh, this is obvious. It shouldn't need to be said. So when we see a person who's a person under 20, a healthy young person, their risk from a serious illness from COVID is minuscule, minuscule. Why would you take an experimental vaccine with any significant side effect? Uh, I mean, it's an individual decision. It should be an individual decision. In our country, it was mandated in our college campuses. We had more than 5,000 colleges and universities require healthy young people with minuscule risk from COVID to take vaccines. That, that's, that's an abject outrage. Uh, that's, that's a, that's, that to me is a disqualifier for being a president of a university or a provost of a university. I think they should immediately have lost their jobs that's unethical, uh, but they did that. And so what's the, what's the reason for knowing the data on the side effects is that you have to make, you're supposed to be able to make a decision. Is it worth taking a vaccine? By the way, an experimental vaccine. Okay, the second part about uh, this vaccine data that should be known uh, is that there is, the public was fooled on the, on the benefit of the vaccine. How were they fooled? Well, uh, they, they were talking about something called relative risk rather than absolute risk. And this is sort of potentially boring, but uh, I thought I would say it, which is that when you say that there's a 50% fewer cases of a disease, therefore you're protected by the vaccine. As an example, 50% fewer. That number is very impressive. And it may be statistically significant in the science terminology. But the, what if the reality is that uh, only four out of a billion people would get a disease, disease X. And when you give the vaccine, two out of a billion people get the disease X. You're starting off by saying almost no one gets the disease. So yes, there's a 50% reduction, but there's a perspective here. There's a context. Right. So this again was a, was a dereliction of duty, was a, was a, a real failure of science, of scientists uh, to not point out to the public the difference between what is called relative risk versus absolute risk. We now know that the responsibility is on us as individuals in a free society to know what we're talking about, to go investigate the source and the data, uh, because the era of trusting people on the solely on the basis of their credential is over. These people have disqualified themselves. They're not critical thinkers. They, they're in, inept, they're incompetent, but also they're not to be trusted. They manipulated the public instead of gave us the information and let us decide. We cannot live in a, I don't want to live in a society like that. Let's yeah, put it that way. I agree. I mean, I'm, I'm, this is the example of a vaccine chart and you see that little babies, a nine months old, are supposed to take the COVID-19 vaccine. Why would a nine month old baby need to take the COVID vaccine? Yeah. And, I mean, and, and then they don't actually, I mean, I have never been to a doctor who told me what the risks are of taking the vaccine. I've never been to one. And, and look, many of them are, I have many, I'm, I'm Jewish. So I have many friends that are doctors, uh, but I, I'm not sure that they're even encouraged or told what the, what the, what the risks are. It's more like, okay, send the nurse in, jab the child and leave. I think, like you said, the era of just trusting the experts is over. Is over. They have undermined their own credibility. The lack of trust is caused by the, by the behavior of the public health leaders, 
by the guidance, by the demonization of people who didn't want to take the vaccine, by the mandates that should have never been in place, literally never been in place for COVID vaccines for anybody in a free society. And again, this this circles back to this topic, how do you restore trust? Mm-hmm. Okay, and I, and I think this is very important to cover. Uh, one, one way to, to restore trust, first of all, we need a complete house cleaning, okay, of all the public health agencies, not just at the top, but even people who have had career bureaucrats, we need to instill term limits in agency positions. It's not just the elected officials. These bureaucrats that are in their positions for decades, they actually, this is one thing I learned, they actually run the government. Okay, that's not an an exaggeration. They outlast a president, a presidential administration. They run things. They were posting things. The CDC website, these these documents were posted by people who were mid to upper level bureaucrats, not necessarily even the head of the CDC, let alone the administration who appoints the head of the CDC. So we do instill term limits. We need to define a public health emergency with time limits. If you think about it, the public health emergency declaration uh, is the gateway to all the required things, the mandates, the uh, uh, circumventing constitutional rights. That should never happen, by the way. No emergency, no health emergency ever overrides guaranteed constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. But the public health emergency itself is a very nebulous term. There's no real good definition. And in fact, it should have very short time constraints. You, the, you declare an emergency, which by definition uh, is a sudden, unexpected occurrence. So uh, Biden, President Biden, uh, renewed a public health declaration two years after the pandemic. I mean, there's plenty of time to, to not consider it an emergency and put in, uh, you know, real credible, accountable legislative or other uh you know, policies, uh, we, we need to insist on information transparency. And that means not just sort of a nebulous assertion, but every meeting in the FDA, the NIH, the CDC <clears throat> should be visible to the public. Every meeting should be posted on the internet, should be recorded. You know, we saw statements being made in October, I think October 21, one of the FDA's advisors to the Committee on Vaccinations for Children for COVID said the following, quote, we just have to give it to figure out how safe it is. That's just the way it is, unquote. Okay, that's unacceptable. That's barbaric. That's a human rights violation that should never be allowed in a free society. Uh, So we need to have these, uh, and every time I say that, people don't even know that that statement was made. And so uh, we need to have these meetings very visible, fully visible. Uh, you know, we need to have people, uh, frankly, uh, bottom line, who step up, who have courage, who speak the truth. Uh, because the mo- one of the things I did learn about being somebody who early on spoke up was that what's the importance of that? It's not just to say it. It's to empower others to speak up. Because not everybody wants to be at the tip of the spear, so-called. I don't blame them. Uh, But I do think it's very important when you speak up, people realize, hey, you know, I agree with that person. Yes, I'm going to speak up too. We need to act like free society individuals or those freedoms disappear. We are so lucky to have doctors like you with courage. There are not enough of them, but I do think that people who are listening to you are going to be encouraged to be the tip of the spear or at least follow you. And I'm, I'm just grateful. I mean, thank God I know you because I get to hear some of the truth. And I hope for those who are listening, they feel a little more empowered, a little uh, better able to think critically. First of all, I want to strongly recommend your book. It was fascinating. So we'll post a link to it too. Are you on social media or have you been completely uh, well, deplatformed? Uh, uh, you know, uh, at one point, uh, I, you know, I was censored myself. I mean, I was the advisor to the president giving the data on masks and the Twitter felt that they should take down my account. Uh, you would think that the country uh, would want to hear what the advisor to the president is saying to the president. Right. Uh, they took down an interview I did uh, months earlier <laughs> when I was at Stanford before I came to Washington and then YouTube 
took it down. Facebook t- took it down. They blocked a conference I held with uh, Governor DeSantis in 2021 with Q&A from the press. They took it down. So I think we need to fight back against that. So uh, yes, the answer is yes. I'm, I have some uh, Twitter. On X. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, we, we're a society that depends on billionaires, unfortunately. The good news is we have at least one billionaire who wants freedom of speech, and that's Elon Musk. And I'm very thankful uh, to him for that, honestly. Uh, I have a, a podcast that I do called Independent Truths uh, that has a Twitter account. Uh, and I, uh, to, to, you know, I had so many death threats, frankly, and uh, Twitter had, had become a center for people expressing a lot of hatred and uh, really, I think it was an embarrassment for our country. I, uh, and, you know, at the request of my own family, I got off of Twitter it wasn't uh, it wasn't worth it to stay on, but I I think it's important to be visible. Social media is the town hall, so I have a Twitter account for that. I have a Twitter account for a, a policy institute. My full time job is a senior fellow at Hoover Institution. I also am involved with Global Liberty Institute, which is a quote to restore liberty in the free exchange of ideas unquote. And the Global Liberty Institute has a Twitter account. Uh, that I'm involved with. So, uh, yeah, I'm out there and I, I speak out and, uh, you know, I speak out, uh, because I'm, I'm free to speak out partly because I know right from wrong. Uh, and I don't care. Uh, that's just partly my personality, uh, you know, speaking out against the NIH and, uh, you know, we need to decentralize the funding for instance, of, of science research, which I didn't mention earlier. It is very critical. Mm. We need to take power away from bureaucrats. But we do need good people, and there are many, to stand up, speak out, get involved, run for public office, uh, understand that, uh, you know, we need an ethical society, uh, and we need to have people who run for office who win that actually realize they're, they're the leader for the people, even though they didn't necessarily get their vote. So I know there's a lot of complicated stuff to do as a society, but we have a new status quo, and the status quo is bad. We need to fix it. Well, hopefully there's a silver lining in everything that we've been through. And I hope that everybody listens to you. But more than that, I hope that many physicians listen to you because we need them to wake up and and stand up for truth and do the right thing so we can trust them again. Thank you. you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me.